Hello, everyone. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio Network, a subsidiary of Global Media Network, LLC, where our mantra is to educate, enlighten, and entertain. The views of the guest may not represent those of the host of the station. Folks, I am always excited when I do a show. It is actually the highlight of my day when I do a show. And with me today, I always have exceptional guests, and today I have another exceptional guest, which I will tell you about. I have with me today William Cooper. He is an attorney, national columnist, and award-winning author. His commentary has appeared in hundreds of publications around the world, including the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago Sun-Times, Dallas Morning News. Huffington Post, Toronto Store, and Jerusalem Post. Publishers Weekly calls his writings about American politics a compelling rallying cry for democratic institutions under threat in America. He has written uh, several books, and the one that he's going to talk to us today about is his newest book, How America Works and Why It Doesn't. A Brief Guide to the U.S. Political System. Welcome, William Cooper, to Chatting with Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you with me. I always ask um, the authors, writers, uh, what motivated you to write this book, number one? And number two, did you plan to have it out around election time? (laughs) Good question. So, <laughs> good the first, timing. The first, yeah. <laughs> On the first question, the motivator was after Trump left office the first time, I really was wanting and expecting U.S. politics to revert, at least in the direction of the mean, and, and, and then to some extent become more normal again. Um, compared to at least the way it historically has been for the preceding decades. And it didn't feel like that was happening. It felt like a lot of the irrationality and polarization was just continuing in in new forms. And so I wanted to put something out there that really tried to assess the root cause of that irrationality and polarization. And so that was the book. As far as the timing goes, It was coincidental that the book was ready to go with the publisher in time to be out here uh, ahead of the election, but it was also something that we were aware of and happy about. So it wasn't a strategic plan when I started (laughs) writing it, but it was definitely something that we were happy with and and wanted to emphasize. Well, uh, Ty, this is a, a book to definitely read. Uh, before going to the voting booth, I think, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think it's very eye-opening, and people really need to read your book with an an open mind. Um, I know it opened uh, my eyes up to uh, a few things. And, you know, William, I have to ask you this, because you are into politics. I never understood the electoral college, and I still don't understand it at my (laughs) age. (laughs) Um, Do you find that, you know, in your in your work that a lot of people don't understand how the electoral college works? Absolutely, Betsy. You are not alone in struggling to understand it, and I confess that the every nuance and history surrounding the electoral college uh, is not within my uh, purview either. It's a really complicated situation. I mean, it was, it's a constitutional provision. It's right there in the Constitution. Um, and, and so it's both important and fundamental to our system, but also something that people thought was a good idea several hundred years ago when the country was a very different place. And when you add all that together, it makes it quite complicated. Yeah, it is, because when I was younger, um, and I'm talking young as in grammar school, 
I, you know, would think, oh, well, if the person who had the most votes should win. And then I was told about the, yeah, (laughs) I told about the Electoral College. And here I am, going to be 67 in uh, December, and I still can't figure it out. Um, Do you think that will change? Well, no, I guess it can't change because it's in the Constitution. Uh, Will it? It just won't change. Yeah. I think I'm it's sorry, unlikely. There could, I think it's unlikely. I think to change, in, at least in any time soon, there could be a constitutional amendment that changed it. But um, you're right; it's in the constitution, and so that makes it difficult to change. Yeah, that's. Um, it, it just still fascinates me because I was even talking to my son about it. Um, how I, you know, it, it always confused me. And um, thank you for saying I'm not the only one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I'm glad there's other people out there who find it just as confusing. Uh, William, I know this is a loaded question, but why isn't America working? Well, to me, there's the, the key root cause for why America isn't working the way it's supposed to is the American people themselves. We are a country, we are a democracy, we go out and vote, and it's easy to blame one politician or the other, but ultimately it comes down to um, you know, what we as a people do. And I think there's three things that are causing the American people in general, not everyone, but in general to be more irrational, more polarized than we have previous. And this is really the root cause. And those three things are age-old human bias that we all have to varying degrees, combined with number two, social media, which is relatively new, and number three, our political system that is malformed. We've only got two political parties, so there's huge rivalry there. We have gerrymandering, closed primaries, and other problems. So it's the combination of those three things that I think are causing the country not to work the way it's supposed to. that that's very uh interesting uh thank you for that i find you know there's a lot of um misinformation as they would say on social media both sides and i just you know being that the age that i am (laughs) i can remember when okay politics was they always play dirty you know they throw the dirt they get the dirt on the other person but to me, William, it was more civilized in my youth than it is now. Now it just seems like, you know, it's a free-for-all. Um, not only do they go after the candidate, but they go after the candidate's family and their children. And that's not right. Leave the kids out of it. They have nothing to do with it. I totally agree. And it's an example of exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about irrationality and polarization. It has reached such heights that it's not just rivalry, it's actually political enemies where you want to destroy the other side. And that's not the way to do it. I I couldn't agree more. And, And that sort of fever pitch that we see is emblematic of a polity that is not functioning the way it's supposed to. And we're seeing it in a lot of different ways, including going after family members. And one thing I'm worried about that that could happen if we're not able to fix things and move in the right direction is more and more of the criminalization of politics where prosecutors start going after political rivals more and more. So you're not only going after the politician, you're only going after the family. Now you're actually trying to throw the other side in jail and that's mm-hmm. a very dangerous precursor to uh, to even worse things. So we need to really be careful not to go down that road, down that road in a big way. Yes, yes, um, definitely using the uh, Department of Justice to you know arrest a political opponent for whatever reason they think is necessary to remove them from from power. Um, I feel like politics and my lifetime has gone 
like on steroids. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, really um, out of control. My son and I went to see the movie Reagan, which um, we really enjoyed. And I'm going to paraphrase because I can't remember exactly. But Chip O'Neill, he said to Ronald Reagan, you know, after six, we're friends. We can have a drink together, something to that effect. There's no Democrat or Republican after 6 p.m. And I think that back then they worked, um, it was more civilized. They might have been friends, you know, after hours. They might have hung out and had a drink together, maybe went golfing together. And it wasn't the, such this, this hate that you see of insults. You know, like, I don't see where it is beneficial to destroy your opponent's character. Can we do politics without destroying a person's character? Is there a, there's no reason to say this one is stupid. This one's deplorable. This one is, is, I mean, it's just stick to the policies, you know, stick to what's your agenda. That's what people want to know. They don't want to know, me personally, I don't want to know their opinion of their opponent. I want to know what are you going to do for me? What are you doing for America? And that's what I I completely agree. We're on the same page. And, you know, one of the things that happens because of the polarization is that everybody, everybody that's engaged in that type of behavior, what they say, well, the other side's so bad that what I'm doing is justified. But when, when that's your mentality, then the other side sees what you're doing, and they say, well, now they're so bad that my behavior is justified, so they behave worse. And then, the, and then the other side does things even worse because they feel like they're justified. And it's this horrible flywheel spinning in the wrong direction, this race to the bottom because everybody says, well, yeah, I know. We shouldn't be this bad, but the other side's worse, so I need to counteract that. And what we need to do is just break that cycle where people step back and try to have some decency. And I think your example of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan is a great one. You know, those two people wanted – different things from a legislative perspective, from a governmental perspective, but they were able to keep it cordial and rational, and they were able to actually enjoy each other's company outside the confines of politics. We desperately need to move strongly in that direction. Yes, yes. Uh, Bring back, like, how it used to be, because I was – taught in the preschool, William, and to me, sometimes these candidates are acting like preschoolers. Uh, <laughs> I they need to learn. They need to learn how to play in the sandbox with some manners <laughs> and um, not be so uh, vicious to each other because it's really not, uh, it's not a good example, really, and it's not really helping uh, anybody. Uh, I have to ask you, um, this question, why is there just a two-party system? I mean, I know that there's the libertarians, but it seems to be basically and always has been Democrat and Republican. Um, That might have been from way back, (laughs) way back when. Yeah, it's been that way for a real long time. It's a great question. To me, the two-party system has a real huge negative component to it, which is you get two platforms. So any idea, any candidate to have a fighting chance in most elections has to choose one or the other. But reality is much more multifaceted than that. So a lot of really important ideas don't get on either platform. And the marketplace of ideas is totally stifled because you just have two big parties arguing. You don't have the multiplicity of views you would want to really get the best ideas out there and and heard consistently. Your question about how we got here, I confess to not knowing. I don't know the origins and the history of how this became this way. What I do think is what keeps it this way is just the incredible power of those parties. That's where all the money flows. That's where all the donors are. They're incumbents, and they're very good 
They might not be good at developing the best policy all the time, but they're very good at capturing and maintaining their monopoly on their side of, of the aisle. And, and it makes third party challenges, you know, third parties never do anything meaningful in terms of potentially having governing influence. They're spoilers in the occasional election. That's the, the heights of what they can do. Uh, and it's real unfortunate. Now, I, I will that, add, if we had, oh, go ahead. If we had one, one footnote there, I'm not saying if we had more political parties, all our problems would go away. We'd still have all sorts of issues. We'd still have social media. We'd still have tribalism. There'd still be challengers. But I do think it'd be an important step in the right direction just to free us from this sort of duopoly of closed-minded ideologies. I agree. I think that the Democrats and Republicans, they don't want a third party because I think they look at it. I mean, I could be wrong. This is just my opinion, folks. They look at a third party as you're taking votes away from me. It's exactly right. Um, as what I as what is my opinion is on um, why there's not a third party. And I guess third party people like, um, say, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr., maybe, I mean, I'm sure he has the money, but maybe not as much money and power as a Democrat or Republican running because you need that money. Exactly. You can't compete with the Republicans unless you're a Democrat. You can't compete with the Democrats unless you're a Republican. And that system's really powerful and really entrenched. And, and it's too bad. And, and you see also things like when Trump first came up in 2016, he was, he, his, in, in 2015, when he just started campaigning, you know, he only had a quarter to a third of the Republicans behind him. That's all he had. So he had a quarter of half the country. That's it. Rubio, Cruz, Bush, these candidates had similar amount of backing. But when Trump was able to, to win the plurality between those four, everybody else in the party coalesced around him. And then once they coalesced around him, they, they became, you know, he became their champion. But if there were more parties and more diverse you know, set of groups out there, it wouldn't be the case that just because somebody is able to get a plurality in one group, they're going to dominate half the scene and, and potentially win the presidency. So it, it would really, um, you know, do a lot of good if we could get more diverse. Yes, yes, I, I definitely uh, agree. Um, you could see that the old system is not working. You know, people are not happy with um, sometimes either candidate. You just try to choose, as my, as the old saying, the lesser of the two evils, um, and hope your candidate, you know, uh, works out. But there should be more uh, choice. I, I definitely uh, believe that. Uh, what do you see as, uh, I might have asked you this, <laughs> as the biggest threat to the U.S. I didn't ask you that question already, did I, William? You did not, no. And okay. I think, the, I think there's, a, there's several things that are quite concerning about what's happening. Um, the, I think the single biggest threat is the, um, the weakening of the electoral system and the weakening of people f accepting the results of elections as being legitimate. I think Donald Trump is the biggest bad actor in this space, but I don't think he's alone. I think the Republicans are worse than the Democrats, but I don't think the Democrats have clean hands across the board. I think we have uh, a real problem because the premise of our entire governmental system is you hold a free and fair election, then the results come in, and then government is reorganized to be consistent with the results. 
Everything else flows from that. Everything. The presidency, Congress, the courts, everything starts there and then flows forward. So if you tinker with that, or if you undermine that, if you weaken that, you're threatening the entire system itself. And I'm optimistic that when Trump is no longer on the scene, things get better. Um, but I don't know if that's, if that's going to happen to a significant degree, um, and I don't know what it's going to look like. But if we, if we continue to undermine the first premise of our system, I think we're going to be uh, in a much worse place than, than we've been. Yes, yes, I uh, agree. Um, sometimes I, I don't uh, remember, but as far as I can remember, was Trump the first person to question the election results? No. So he's definitely not the first person to play games with elections. He is, however, by far the loudest the most damaging. We have never, ever, ever had a president, a sitting president, being told by everybody uh, involved, including his own attorney general, his own administration, that he lost an election, that there was not fraud, that he lost, and nonetheless claim that he won, nonetheless try to undermine the transition of power. And I'm not just talking about January 6th wasn't just that day. What Trump did surrounding the election uh, and for several months after the election was thoroughly try to undermine the result and reverse it. And there's never been anything like that. So he's not alone, but he's definitely the worst actor, um, in my opinion, by far. And I would, put, I would say in the history of our country. Oh, no. And now that I think about it, was George Bush... Uh, between Al Gore, was that um, in question? If I so there was a big there was a big brouhaha over the election between Bush and Gore, and it and it was handled the way it's supposed to be. It went to the court system. Both sides had really good lawyers. They litigated the issues. All came down to Florida. It went finally. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. For better or for worse, that is the place it's supposed to be resolved when there are disputes. And even if you didn't like the outcome, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, made a ruling. And then Al Gore, to his great credit at, the, at that time, conceded. He conceded the election. He was the incumbent vice president. He stepped aside. He believed he won. I, I'm sure he believed deep into his bones that he won. And yet he conceded. So it was a humongous contrast between what happened in 20, 2000 and what happened uh, with Trump. Light years different. In fact, yes. I'd contrast those as the first one is how you're supposed to do it. The second one is how you're not supposed to do it. Because it's, okay. yeah. it's okay to contest an election. If there's a close election, you're allowed to fight it. You're allowed to go to the courts. Nothing wrong with that. You just have to respect the system and respect the outcome. Yes, yes. Um, kind of reminds me of a spoiled child not wanting to let go of their toy. Um, <laughs> it's a very know. good analogy, which is scary. <laughs> or a dog with a bone, you know, not going to uh, let go. And um, it's very, in my opinion, um, selfish on their part, wh whoever it is. I don't care what party. It's just a very self or self centered thing to do to to behave like that. So if anyone wants to send me hate mail, that's okay. <laughs> that's um you know, just no, not a good example. <laughs> Excuse me, it's kinda of like reminds me of being a sore sore loser. And what are some of the public uh policy failures that America's uh great lie to government fails to address in your opinion, William? Yeah, good question because it's one thing to say, Oh, the system isn't working and people are being irrational and polarized and all that, but at the end of the day the government you have to actually look at what the government's doing and 
and and support I have to support that thesis with actual examples of the government not meeting the needs of the people there are a number of examples I put them in the book uh, immigration I'm not a partisan on immigration I just want a rational functional system where what we decide as a people to do we actually implement so I'm I'm inclusive philosophically but I think we should have laws I think they should be re reasonable they should be enforced we should have some control over the border in the ways that we as a people decide to have and not have it functioning you know totally randomly and and arbitrarily the way it is now I think health care is a big problem we have incredible health care on the upper end lots of people have really good health care but then lots of people don't lots of people don't have insurance don't get the needs that they should uh, that they have met and then there's also incredible expense I mean health care is just gobbling up a huge percentage of our GDP every year in a way that's not not at all optimal I think criminal justice is a, is a big example we have a tremendous amount of over incarceration in this country where people often vulnerable people from underprivileged backgrounds are just thrown in jail left uh, they're way too long the conditions are terrible there's not ways to help them when they come out of society help them prosper and, and flourish so the list is long I mean public schools are the upper end of the public school system is wonderful very good but the middle and, and especially at the bottom is terrible so we have millions and millions of of Americans that have gone to school and are going to school in the last few decades that have just not gotten a good education it hasn't been a good environment and so they're just starting off as as teenagers and and young adults with one hand tied behind their back and that's just really unfair and an indictment not only of our present conscious but also our future prospects so there's lots of examples uh, I think those are some prominent ones oh that's yeah that's great I, I could tell you um, I was on I live in New Jersey I was on the New Jersey get covered which really was not great the out-of-pocket yeah. was ridiculous the coverage was um, horrible but I didn't have a choice my husband's company decided to drop us <laughs> and um, there I was with uh, our insurance so I, I had no choice but to, to go on that and you know Medicare is, is much better but you know what I don't know how people do it William because I'm one person paying Medicare and a supplement because Medicare is not enough thankfully I'm healthy and I don't need a lot of medication but uh, you know the price of pharmaceuticals is the medications out of control um, so really I'll, tell the, I'll tell the audience this I know I say this on many shows stay healthy folks <laughs> because when you're my age you got to go on Medicare prescription program um, it cost um, a lot and they keep changing you know what they're covering what they're not covering the different tiers <coughs> excuse me change well, um, yearly and um, yeah. so yeah that uh, definitely and that you know what I I agree with you about immigration because you know I have nothing against uh, people come over to this country I myself am a byproduct of um, immigrants even my mother's parents came over illegally at the time over 100 years ago so I just believe in having a system where people can get vetted and get citizenship and not take as long as it does now um, they need to do something with, with that system to speed up the process um, but I definitely feel that you know if you want to come here for a better life power to you then you know do it the right channels and let's yeah, make those channels the, easy yeah <laughs> the ideal for me with immigration is a very inclusive welcoming system but one that actually lines up intent with implementation so we as a people decide to be inclusive to have a system and then the system works the way we want it and we don't have 
so much illegality. You don't have so many cases in, in courts that are held up for years, even decade plus. You don't have all of these just ad hoc, um, inefficient, arbitrary things going on. You have a welcoming, inclusive system where people can earn citizenship, and, and it, it all kind of lines up and makes sense. Um, that's the ideal for me. Yes, I, I, I agree uh, with you, uh, William. William, what would you like the readers to take away from reading your book? I think the biggest thing I'd like readers to take away from the book is just to slow down and try to extricate yourself from one side or the other if you're inclined to be that way. I think a lot of our problems, all of the things that we're talking about, Betsy, in this, in this uh, current segment about policy challenges, you know, so much of, of, of the, the challenges we face are truly nonpartisan are truly things that we should be in it together. We can disagree on the margins, and in some areas we're not going to agree at all, and that's fine. But there's so many things as a country that we should be wanting to tackle together. The environment, you know, keeping the environment, that's another example of a failure I could have added to the list. I should have added to the list a few minutes ago. It's in everybody's interest for the environment to, to, be, fun, uh, to be in good shape. Nobody wants... Um, you know, our young people to struggle in, in these schools that are, you know, totally uneven where a wealthy child has a great education and a poor child has a terrible one. Who would want that? So I think there's so many challenges that we could, we could try to solve together, even if we, if we agree that in certain places we're not going to be able to do that. And so if we can unshackle ourselves from partisanship and just try to look at these issues in a more practical way, we would improve so much. And, you know, pointing out why we're so polarized, why there's such tribalism, and getting people to recognize it and step back is the principal aim of the book. I love it. I, I think it's a, a great book. And before I let you go, I have to ask you this uh, question. I, I think you touched on it briefly, but what do you see as the root cause of the Americans being irrational, the irrationality that's going on, I think on both sides. I, I agree. I think it's on both sides, too. I think, it's, I think it goes back to those three factors, right? We've got <clears throat> age-old human bias. So everybody, you, me, everybody, the way the human brain works is that there's bias. Like we are not perfectly functioning machines in between our ears. Confirmation bias is a big example, right? We see things, new information comes in, we interpret it consistent with our, our worldviews. That's a part of all people to varying degrees. Some people are more susceptible to it than others. But that's the first factor. Like we're, we are all biased to varying degrees, and we should accept that, acknowledge that, try to, try to improve. The second factor is the internet and primarily social media, but we've got all these eco chambers online where people can gravitate to what they want. They can reinforce their worldviews online in their eco chambers. And so that, that makes the age old bias that we have that more worse. So the first factor and the second factor work together to increase our bias, to increase our partisanship. And what you would want with those two factors working together to make us more partisan, you would want a political system that, that tamed those passions. You would want a political system that helped us fight through those biases and be more rational. But our political system does the opposite. It turbocharges our biases. We've got two rival parties, these two juggernaut rivals, where they're battling it out every day. And the fewer the tribes, the worse the tribalism. They're just focusing on each other. We've got closed primaries where you don't let moderates into the race. We've got gerrymandering where you rig elections to keep your side in power. So the political system defects are the third factor. When you combine those three together, you have a flywheel spinning in the exact wrong direction, increasing compounding our bias, compounding our partisanship, 
So I think that's the root cause. That flywheel with those three components is the root cause. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, for coming on today, uh, William. Um, and where can people buy your book, How America Works and Why It Doesn't? A Brief Guide to the U.S. Political System. Where can someone find your book? It's very easy to find online. If you Google it, of course, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, and local bookstores have it as well. But if you just Google it, it'll, it'll uh, easy to find wherever you buy your books. And then my website that has my books and my columns and, and other content is will-cooper.com. That's W-I-L-L-C-O-O-P-E-R.com. Well, thank you so much. I so enjoyed talking to you today. Uh, William Cooper, you are a pleasure. You have a nice voice, too. Uh, you have a thank very you, nice Betsy. voice, too, <laughs> uh, to you. talk to a Very uh, interesting. <laughs> Folks, I, I have to be honest. You know what? I don't read a lot of political books, and I really – haven't had a lot of political guests on, but I'm dipping my toe <laughs> um, into it. And I really enjoyed reading your book, William. So um, thank you for writing your book. And folks, you know, get this book, open your eyes to what's going on in our political system, systems. And, you know, on both sides of the aisle, we need to my father would used to say, we better shape up, straighten up, and fly right. That's what my father used to say. When are you going to wise up? <laughs> no. Old, well, thank you. old um, thank you. World War II vet. <laughs> Excuse me. I was just, just going to say thank you, Betsy. You have a great, a great show, and it's a privilege to be on it. So thank you. Oh, you are welcome, and it is uh, my pleasure. Folks, all the information about William Cooper will be in the blog that Jeannie White, who's station manager, writes and produces the show. I highly recommend on going on Will Cooper's website. You will see all his uh, books, the wonderful uh, writings that he does, and uh, what a wonderful um, columnist uh, and writer uh, that William Cooper is. And I want to thank Lonely and Caldwell. CEO of Hesh World Talk Radio Network, who makes this all possible. And I want to thank you, the listeners. If you don't already subscribe to Chatting with Betsy, uh, please do so. It is for free. I'm on Spotify, Spreaker, Apple, and Amazon Music, to name a few. Please share this show with other people. I'm here to be a resource and to help people. And you know what? Sometimes it's opening up our eyes, isn't it? And uh, that's what I'm here for. Uh, I'm trying to change the world from my little corner of uh, in New Jersey, <laughs> from my microphone. And uh, I just want people to have a better life. And we need to bring back our humanity, both sides of the aisle. And we need to just be human to each other. And as I always say at the end of my show, in a world where you could be anything, to please be kind, shine your light bright, because we need it more, now more than ever before. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio Network, a subsidiary of Global Media Network, LLC. Bye-bye now. <laughs>